I don't see Lydia here yet, unless I'm just missing her. Uh-oh. Well, I guess we're not starting then. <laughs> <laughs> What? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Michaela. I'm going to be the moderator today. Just a little bit of background on me. I'm a senior SAEM major and the current arts committee director for the SAEM club. And if you guys feel comfortable turning on your cameras, that's great. We love to see everyone's faces, but if not, no worries. And all questions are definitely welcome and appreciated. If you want to either throw them in the chat or just take a mental note when you think of one and we will get to them at the end. So now I really just want to pass it over to Lydia and Rebecca just to introduce yourselves if you want to state some background information and some steps that you took to get to the point where you're at now. Yeah, Rebecca, do you want to go or I can go? It doesn't um, really matter. Yeah, you can go first. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. My name is Lydia Grimmenstein. Um, I am a December 2020 graduate of the SAM program. And I had an arts focus, um, mainly in the nonprofit arts community. Uh, my background is arts. I mean, I am an arts person all around. I used to be a dancer. I was a musician. I was a studio artist. Um, so really, this was a no brainer when I went to Point Park and said, I want to pursue arts management. So I did. Um, and I am currently the assistant manager of patron services with the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater here in downtown Pittsburgh. I work in the marketing department um, and I got this job out of an internship that I got my first semester here at Point Park. Um, and I actually applied for it before I even enrolled in Point Park. I really just went for it. Um, so I interned with the PBT school. I interned with Pittsburgh Public Theater. I interned with the Three Rivers Young People's Orchestra. Um, and all of those experiences really allowed me to learn the skills that I needed in order to perform the job that I am currently in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of me. That's where I'm at right now. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I guess I would say my journey is probably less um, ordinary or less kind of like, like the normal process of things. Um, so I actually got my undergraduate in um, public relations at a very tiny school in West Virginia called the University of Charleston. Um, I was there for a three and a half years and actually when I first started I was undecided um, and I had a conversation with my advisor and you know they had said that you're very personable and you seem like you like to talk a lot and communicate. Have you ever thought about going into public relations or communications? So at that time, I'm like 18, 19, had never met anybody who was in that field, um, families or friends or anything. And my first question for my advisor was, can I make money doing that? Like, <laughs> like will I make a living if I go into that field? Um, so I got into an intro to PR class and it kind of just clicked from there. And I, I just really kind of fell in love with public relations. Um, so then I... You know, I graduated a semester early from undergrad and had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Um, and when in doubt, go to grad school. So I, uh, I fell in love with Pittsburgh at the age of 18. So when I was looking for grad schools, um, Point Park was kind of at the top of my list, mostly because I had the opportunity to do the double master's program. So I got my master's in journalism and my master's in business administration with a concentration in public relations and advertising. Say that 10 times fast. Um, <laughs> so um, I decided to, to go that route. And I will be incredibly honest and realistic. While I was in grad school, while I was in Pittsburgh, I was a barista for a year and a half while I was doing it. It was a very you know difficult time trying to find work, trying to break into the industry. Um, so you know I slung coffee <laughs> while I was finishing my MBA. Um, and that's when I got um, into an organization called Brightside Academy. Um, I worked there as an enrollment specialist. And then I worked at k &L Gates, um, which is a law firm. And so as I transitioned into the, the arts industry, it was kind of like the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust found me more than me finding them. I'd, I'd always known about them because I love um, the Three Rivers Arts Festival. I love the gallery crawls they do downtown. So they were always on my radar, but it wasn't necessarily something that um, I like knew that I would do. So they, they found me and um, it's just been an incredibly, you know, 
um, great experience uh, to work for them. I think that's <laughs> the gist of it. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I think something that I've learned just through this major is that there's so many different ways to get to your end goal in your career. And something that all the professors really say here is just take every opportunity that's given to you because you never know what's going to lead. And I think you guys have both really kind of reiterated that for me and also hopefully people listening as well. So thank you. Um, I want to start on a bit of a happier note and talk about some of the more positive impacts that you've seen over the past year. And if you both could just express some optimistic changes you've seen in the arts industry as a result of COVID, I'd like to start there. Um, well, for me, uh, one of the more positive impacts of the pandemic, um, which sounds really weird to say, but I mean, it was a positive impact, so <laughs> um, was our ability to be more creative than we usually were, um, especially when the pandemic started. I'm, I'm not going to lie, we were in a bit of a rut. We didn't really know what to do for a while, for about a couple months. And so we really had to sit down and really think outside of the box. And I know a lot of people say that, you know, when you get into this industry, you have to think outside of the box. We really had to think outside of the box. Like it was... Yeah, um, but yeah, that creativity and that sort of coming together during all of this craziness, I think was such a positive impact for the arts in general because it taught us to stay together versus being our own separate organizations. Um, and especially with the cultural trust, I think that's really resounded there. And I think that's been a huge positive impact out of all of this. We've really stayed together. We've stayed in contact with the opera, with the CLO, all of those organizations. and really come together and thought, okay, how can we still bring art to Pittsburgh? How can we make people's lives just a little bit happier during all this craziness? Um, so that's, that's definitely been a positive thing for us. Yeah, I, I can definitely share the, the same sentiment. I think it was definitely a learning curve because um, all of our productions are, are in person. You know, we, uh, Broadway is huge for us. Um, and that's kind of like the bulk of what the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust does um, is bring Broadway to Pittsburgh. Um, so not being able to have, you know, um, people in seats has, has been such a learning curve. But I will say the positivity that I've seen, I know that, you know, last year we did an entire digital Three Rivers Arts Festival. And that's not, that's something that we've never done before. Um, and, you know, I personally worked on a lot of um, just building, building the event pages and things of that nature for it. Um, it was difficult, but I think it allowed us to tap into something that we had never done before. Um, and I think, you know, it'll change the future of arts because now I, I think we'll see more um, performing arts venues offer a digital option. So in addition to being able to purchase a ticket, you can also stream it online. And I think that kind of opens up doors for the industry because, you know, it used to be, oh, I don't live in Pittsburgh. I can't go to, I can't go to the Three Rivers Arts Festival. Um, and now, you know, we actually just announced that we're doing it hybrid this year. So we're going to have some in-person events downtown, but we're also going to have things online. And I think it just, you know, like I said, it broadens um, the reach for the arts industry that, that people who thought that they couldn't access that and they thought that you know they they had to dress up or you know they had to be a certain type of way can now enjoy this um the same art that we love from the comfort of their home and I, and I think that's pretty cool yeah yeah I love your outlook on that as someone who's not quite in the industry yet but will hopefully get there I at least see it as more time for artists and the industry as a whole to kind of perfect ideas that they were trying to get to before the pandemic. And I think whether you're into the arts or not, people have noticed the lack of it over the past year. And I maybe I'm being like too optimistic, but I think that's enough to kind of bring it back with a bang when it can actually, you know, we can be there and see it again. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll actually say that, um, you know, I, I think you're right. People have definitely notice that the arts are missing and I think that's really going to help us come back in the end is that people have really noticed that they're gone and that we really need it 
Um, we have had so many subscribers just call the ballet and not for any particular reason, just to tell us that they miss coming to the theater. They miss coming to the Benedum. They miss the dancers. They ask, how are they doing? And how are you guys doing? And it's, it's been really nice. So we're really looking forward to normalcy, whatever that looks like. Yeah, I agree. I agree with them there. <laughs> Rebecca, do you have anything to add or? Yeah, I always like to expand on that. Um, we have seen an outpour in support, um, especially because we, at the beginning, um, closer to March and April of last year, we had launched an, kind of like an emergency critical fund um, is what we called it. Um, and just asking for donations and asking for support. Um, and I wanna say that the first kind of like launch of it, we raised over um, $50,000. So, you know, people really do wanna see, um, they wanna see art again, they wanna be there. So yeah, I, I agree with everything that Lydia said. Great, yeah, I think it's important to talk about the positive, but the negative for me kind of feels like the elephant in the room. I think we also have to talk about that because that it's, it's been a rocky road for the arts this year. So can you explain how both the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater and the Cultural Trust stayed afloat during those early months of lockdown when everything was so uncertain and what that distress was like both for your individual businesses, but also yourselves as just young adults in the industry? Sure. So, oh, you want to talk about the bad months. We don't talk about that, Michaela. We put that out of mind. Um, <laughs> That's not allowed, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So, <laughs> so when the pandemic started about, um, actually a year, a full year ago, it's really weird and terrible to say that, but um, yes, we immediately shut everything down. We had actually had a perfor performances scheduled at the August Wilson Center a week after we were shut down. So we had to immediately call the theater, pull out of it. Um, and then all of our ticket holders, all of our subscribers, they just kind of held on to everything. It was like a big pause that happened. And there wasn't a huge flux of people calling and asking what's going on. Can we get a refund? Because if you remember back then, the entire world was just stopped and everyone was just absorbing what was happening. Um, and so for the first couple months, that's what it really was like for us. Um, one of the things that we did um, that I think really helped us in the long run was to furlough immediately all of our staff, our dancers, our teachers, um, and just allow our senior management to come together and figure out what to do next. Um, and it, that, that, that did really help us. But for those first couple months as a young professional in the industry, that was a little scary to witness. Um, I was a junior at the time, I think. Um, and I was just watching all of this go down from the sidelines. Um, and it was kind of overwhelming um, to just kind of be in those all staff meetings and hear a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unrest, and just a lot of, I don't know if we're going to have the money for this. I don't know if we're going to do A or B. So it was it was a lot up in the air and that was not a happy time. So, <laughs> but we pulled out of it. Everyone pulled out of it. And that's, that's what mattered most. <laughs> yeah, I think we definitely shared that same uncertainty. Um, and for us, we had literally, literally just announced our, the Broadway season. Um, so, you know, we had all of this excitement about the shows that were coming. Um, we announced the return of Hamilton, which was like a huge deal. Um, so, you know, you're kind of building up all this hype on this phenomenal season that we're supposed to have. And then, you know, for us, it wasn't an immediate everything's canceled. It was over a period of time we had shows just drop out, drop out, drop out, drop out. So it was kind of like, like really heartbreaking because we truly, truly thought, and I think um, a lot of the world thought that this was gonna be a six week, th a six week thing and we were all gonna just kind of go back to normal life, whatever that is. Um, so it, it was definitely, you know, some very dark days. And I will say something that we did differently um, from, the, from the Pittsburgh Ballet is that um, they tried to keep all of us on for as long as possible. And, you know, that, that is a different um, way than, than, you know, you guys had handled it. And I think because of that, um, a lot of us are still furloughed. I am personally still furloughed. I'm still waiting to hear when I'm going back. 
um, we are slowly starting to bring people back on, which is which is amazing. Um, so hopefully we can you know return back to normalcy. But I think for us, the effect will always be kind of greater. And I think unfortunately it will take us. I don't want to say years, but it'll take us longer to bounce back because of the amount of people that we had in our theaters. You know, the the Benedum can sit um, about I think almost 10,000. So you know, there's a curve there. Um, and even if we did, you know, every other seat, there's still so many, so many things and so many aspects that would have to be worked on. So it's, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot, but hopefully we're, we're seeing brighter days soon. Yeah, I think heartbreaking is a fantastic word for what's happened. Um, I want to stay on the cultural trust for a minute and just talk about, I see that they've been doing some Liberty and Magic events on uh, Monday night. Those seem to be successful. They've been doing them for a couple months now, as well as some new installations coming. Do you know if those were part of the 2021 plan or if they were more so ways to stay relevant within the COVID restrictions? Yeah, so um, when we first kind of kicked off, uh, the, the Liberty Magic Mondays. Yeah, it was something that, you know, we sat down um, and kind of came up with this like digital calendar of sense. So, you know, we could say on Mondays, we'll have this type of programming. On Tuesdays, we'll do things for kids and for um, education. On Wednesdays, we'll do yada yada. So it was kind of like you said, something that came out of not only needing to bring awareness to the trust, but keep people engaged with us. Um, and Liberty Magic was one of our newer initiatives that we did before the pandemic even happened. Um, Liberty Magic is, I think, less than two years old. So I think we didn't want people to forget about it because we had such uh, stamina and such, you know, such urgency um, around the initiatives. So it's, it's definitely something that um, prior to me getting furloughed, I, I was moderating them and we did see a lot of people um, who were still attending, you know, the, the virtual magic shows. Um, and I think it was cool because, you know, we call people who are in their home and we have them participate, you know, on camera in front of an audience with the magician. And, you know, I think things like that aren't necessarily things that we could have done, you know, in house or in, in um, if we were in the venue. So it, it does open up more opportunity when it comes to those type of type of things. Awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. And I know you mentioned the Three Rivers Arts Festival earlier. With that being in the hybrid format and such a large city event that people look forward to, do you think that the Cultural Trust feels some, some pressure to kind of uphold the expectations that people already have for that event? And how do you think that kind of encompasses the arts industry as a whole with events coming back in different platforms? Absolutely. Um, prior to even, you know, the hybrid, last year announcing that we were going completely digital broke a lot of hearts. You know, we had we had a lot of people um, on social who were very disappointed, and I completely understand it. I was disappointed, but, you know, you, you kind of have to do what's best for um, the greater good. And, you know, especially at that point, we didn't understand COVID to the point that we understand it now. So it would have been highly irresponsible to even try to do a hybrid thing last year. Um, so going to that, I think it's gonna kind of be the same thing. I think everybody is used to having a specific type of track, a specific type of arts festival. Um, you know, when I went in 2019, it was the first time that I had saw, you know, a really big artist that I knew off name and that was Indy Ivory. And it was one of like, the greatest experiences in my life. So we are battling not only COVID, we are battling people's memories of this event. We are battling people's experiences and their expectations. And it's incredibly difficult, but I truly think that Pittsburghers understand that we're also doing what we think is best for the greater good. So it's, um, and I think that goes to the industry as well. I think we understand that people are restless and they do want to go back to the theater and they want to be in the shows again, but at what cost? You know, if, if, you know, it's, we love our art, we love what we do, but I don't think it's worth, you know, lives or, or health or safety. So yeah, it's kind of a balancing act right now. 
No, you brought up some great points. I totally agree. Lydia, do you have any anything to offer on the, the expectations aspect of all of this? Well, I actually just wanted to say that I really liked how she worded it, like battling people's expectations, because I, I can say from experience, that's what's been happening at the ballet. Um, you know, every, all of our subscribers are so wonderful and all of our donors, but they love seeing ballet in person. And at the start of the pandemic, when we were starting to think about, okay, well, maybe we could have some digital aspects. We could give them videos. We could give them these other things. It was kind of like battling what they had been used to and kind of going against it because we were introducing these brand new things to them and they weren't used to it. They weren't accustomed. It was a new experience in a new pandemic. Um, so it was just a lot of new. And, and it was, it was battling people's expectations of what they had been accustomed to. Um, but I, th I think it's good. Everyone needs to try new things in the arts. You do eventually, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I see the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater has also added some shows, so that's really exciting for the 2021 season. Can you elaborate a little bit on how those came to be in, in the process of the restrictions that are in place right now? Yes, so one of the um, new performances that we came up with um, and it's actually, I attribute it to our new artistic director, Susan Jaffe, which I think someone just dropped her name in the comments. Um, she's phenomenal. She came from North Carolina. She's great. She used to dance with ABT, amazing. Um, but she came up with this idea of having a performance at the art museum. And so we had that back in October, I think, October or September. It was sometime back in the fall, but it, it was really nice. We had a certain number of dancers um, and they were all, you know, they took the tests, they were socially distanced, they wore masks the entire time, and they performed a piece in the Hall of Sculptures. And we had a set number of people who came to the ticketed event, um, all spaced out, about 25 each. The performance was seven minutes, and we had like four of them on one day. And it was great. And it was, it was something new. And it was something, you know, that our artistic director came up with. And I thought it was amazing. Um, and then, yes, recently, we did Bolero at also at the art museum. So we've done it twice now. People liked it so much. They said, can you do it again? And um, Susan said, yes, absolutely. So we did, it was over February um, 14th over Valentine's day weekend. We did it at the art museum, great turnout. It was great, yeah. So we're very excited to see what she comes up with next. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I feel like they should have done that earlier, ballet in, in the art museum. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, even just the aesthetic of it, yeah. you know, ballet, art, it's a no-brainer. I think it's also notable that the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater does a lot of additional projects that aren't just performances that I feel are really community-driven. Have there been any in the past year that you've added or have found new value in in bringing the community together through the past year? Yes, well, you actually, I think, wrote it in the timeline. It was Dance the Story at Home. That's yeah. something that has gotten tremendous support. Um, and Dance the Story at Home is basically one of our teachers from the student division um, opening a fairy tale story of a classical ballet. So it could be Sleeping Beauty, could be Cinderella, maybe Nutcracker. And she would dance the story at home. So she would act out, you know, part of the ballet from the book, she would read the story. It was very educational and very motivating and inspirational. And it just made so many people very happy to see this video of someone who loved ballet and was sharing it with our audiences and our social media bases. So yeah, that, that was a great community initiative. <laughs> I love that. Um, I wanna shift a little bit and talk more about virtual performances as a whole and kind of get your opinion slash predictions on how we think this is going to play out. So first, I just want to talk about if you think virtual performances will be trending at the rate that they are now post pandemic. I think they will be. Um, but with that, I also would like to say that it truly depends on the organization itself because some organizations have the ability, they have the funding to offer those and others don't. Um, and it, for an example, you could take Boston Ballet. Boston Ballet did a virtual subscription package this season 
um, which I thought was amazing. And I wish everyone could do that. But unfortunately, the reality of the situation is not everyone can. Um, they can offer little snippets of maybe something package based, but not an entire subscription. Um, but, you know, maybe 10 years down the line, five years down the line, maybe that will be the new norm. We just don't know. But I definitely do see it becoming more popular post pandemic just because so many people love the freedom and the safety of watching, you know, art at home. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it'll become um, kind of like, you know, with um, Trust is doing with Trap, like I said earlier, more of a hybrid type thing. Um, I think that there are diehard subscribers that we, like we personally have, and I'm sure that the, the ballet has, that can't wait to get back in person. Um, so I think there's people that are probably tired of the, the digital and virtual aspect. Um, but like I said before, it'll open up more doors for, for us to reach more people. So I think we'll see more people taking the option to stream instead of coming to the theater. Um, you know, things like, I'm not able to find the babysitter tonight. You know, I don't want to give these tickets away. Um, if there's an option to exchange an in-person ticket for a virtual stream, things like that, I think it, it definitely opens um, opens the, the gate more uh, for more people, so yeah. Yeah, those are some really good points because as a younger person, I can't wait to go see a show and I can't imagine people not being excited to do that but COVID has just kind of rewired everything where I can't imagine virtual options not being available because I do think people have kind of gravitated towards them for the freedom that you mentioned. So a, a big thing for me that kind of changed my views on virtual streaming in a larger platform was Hamilton being put on Disney Plus. I want to get your your thoughts on that because I first I was really excited to watch it because as someone who never really had the funds to go see it I was excited to see what people were talking about but I also wondered if it kind of took some of the value for lack of a better term away being able to watch it so freely um, and I want to get your your thoughts on that. So yeah, I um, I actually started at the trust. Um, I think it was about a month or two months right after Hamilton uh, had finished his run. So I was so disappointed that I didn't get to see it. So I was so so excited for you know it, it was supposed to come back um, in January. And I was you know so I'm really bummed about that. And so yeah, I. I watched it on Disney Plus and I definitely think that it just, you can't compare. Like, you know, I don't think it's fair to compare. I think what Hamilton did was get a lot, a lot of people who would never even like go see a show, go to Broadway, go to theater. Um, you know, we all have those, you know, friends and family members that you've tried to encourage to watch Broadway and they're like, come on, like, I'm not doing that. So I think that was so great to see um, that we were kind of all able to bond over something that we necessarily didn't all uh, enjoy prior to it. Um, but I still think that it'll, it'll never be the same though. Like there's nothing like sitting in the seat in the theater, even if you're like in the nosebleeds, <laughs> being able to hear the acoustics and the sound bounce off the walls. And it, so it's, it's just a, it's a very different experience, but I'm really glad at what, you know, Hamilton um, being streamed did do for the industry. Cause I think a lot, it got a lot more people interested in the arts than they have been in the past. Yeah, I agree. Lydia, do you have anything to add? I do. Um, well, anyone who is in this program knows through all of your classes that live entertainment is an experience. And you hear that word a lot. It's an experience. And I actually agree with Rebecca that it's not really fair to compare because nothing can ever compare to sitting in a dark theater fully, you know, immersed in what you're seeing and hearing the sound and the vibrations and just feeling at one with the artists and what they're producing to you that is an experience that can never be translated into a platform like Disney Plus or frankly YouTube or any other platform for that matter. Um, 
is it still worth it though? Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't compare, but it's definitely worth it to keep, you know, providing it for everyone in the world. Um, I watched Hamilton on Disney Plus and halfway through my Wi-Fi cut out and I just kind of shook my phone and went, no. <laughs> so <laughs> I definitely would have preferred to be in a theater for that, but I would not pay $500 to go see it. So a platform like Disney Plus, who, where it's free, you know, that's that's much better i'll take that any day <laughs> yeah I, I just wanted to interject because i i saw it lo- <clears throat> was very fortunate enough to see it live thank you ed travisary uh and while i i absolutely adored and loved the experience of seeing it live and would not trade it for the world there were a lot of aspects of the recorded version that captured things that i didn't see even with with relatively good seats Um, And I think that for uh, audiences that haven't experienced Hamilton, that it's a great introduction to live theater. And I think that it will do more to bring people to live theater than than we will know for a while. But I think that it was such a a wonderful experience that I think that it will it will have a a very positive impact on the performing arts and people will want to see live shows that would never have considered it before. But because there's been so much hype about Hamilton that that I think new people will come and see it. Yeah, yeah, I think the recording was beautifully done. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but that's not what I thought it was going to be. Um, I guess my follow-up question for that is, do you think that opened doors for arts material to be more accessible to people? Because I'm thinking like, if more Broadway shows lean towards that, that'd be a great tool for schools and education. Do you think that opens doors for wider arts in education, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there is um, a streaming service that actually has like an app where you can stream different Broadway shows. Um, And I think we'll see more things like that um, where, you know, we have physical examples for even students of Broadway or students who are studying theater or, um, you know, arts majors to actually be able to experience it um, and, you know, pause on certain things and say, oh, well, look how he did this and um, look at the lighting. And, you know, it changes the way that I think students will even be taught because you won't necessarily have to um, go to the Benidorm and, you know, take a tour backstage to look at things. You'll be able to do it all virtually. Um, So I think there's tools that we should be using and taking from um, the example that we saw um, of Hamilton being displayed on Disney Plus. I will say though, I think not necessarily a negative connotation, but I think it might set a standard that smaller, um, even like the trust are gonna be able to, like you said, show performances to that scale. Like you could literally see the sweat dripping off of (laughs) the lip of the the guy when he was singing. And I think maybe people will have an expectation that every virtual performance is gonna look like that. And unfortunately it's not. A lot of these are gonna be shaky cam um (laughs) from way back so I think there's there's kind of like good tools that we can take from it but it also may increase the public's expectations of what organizations can do on a virtual level yeah those are some really good points thank you for um sharing that that definitely brought in my my aspect of it um, I also want to talk about a Forbes article that I, I shared with you guys, um, anyone listening, it's how the arts industry is coping with 2021. And the part that I found really interesting was where they talked about FOMO, fear of missing out versus actually missing out, and how the knowledge of actually missing plans has replaced FOMO. I first bring this up because that is incredibly relatable. I think everyone... <laughs> has had that happen, but also because it particularly hit the arts industry hard and followers of the arts, because that had a harder time 
converting their material to a to fit a virtual platform. So I want to hear your opinions on that before we go any further. Yes, so I will touch on that a little bit. Um, as far as you know, the arts being converted to virtual platforms, anything can be converted. Um, it some just like you said, they they have a little bit more trouble than others because it's just not the same as going in person. And that's something that's an obstacle that can never be fully overcome. It's just the nature of how it is. And I think that's frankly okay um, for some art forms. Um, for us at the ballet, you know, fear of missing out versus actually missing out. Um, you know, we, we really have looked at this as there is nothing that we can't give to the public that they won't like. We are just going to give it our all. We are going to give them anything and everything that we have and are capable of giving them. Um, and that's in regards to our funding, our dancers contracts, how much they are obligated to give us and how much they want to give. Um, and we're just going to see what happens. Um, and thankfully, we have had such an outstanding stream of support from the Pittsburgh community about that because they, I think, have realized that, oh, I maybe should have gone to that pre-pandemic. And now I regret not doing that. And I think everyone here has definitely felt that at some point during this pandemic. For example, I really wanted to go to this bakery before the pandemic and they closed during the pandemic and now I can never go. So it's just little things like that when you're thinking about the arts. Um, there, there are some regrets, but thankfully, you know, the virtual experiences have offered more avenues, more marketing channels for us to reach people. And they never have to feel like they are, are missing out because we are giving them so, so much. So that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, I think we battle that, like you said, that fear of missing out with kind of creating anticipation, you know, by, by doing virtual things. Um, by having a virtual arts festival, yes, we want it for people to kind of have a substitution, but it was also, you know, you sit and watch these videos and these performances and we want you to feel that. We want you to feel, oh, I can't wait to be back. I can't wait to go to Point State Park and get a turkey leg and <laughs> listen to some music and buy some art. That's the, the feeling that we wanted to create. So I guess in a sense, we are creating FOMO for the future by having virtual programming. Um, because even if virtual programming stays in the future, it is it is kind of temporary. It is kind of a template right now. You know, it, it's something that keeps you engaged, something to keep people um, aware um, of what the trust is doing. But we do want you to have that feeling in your gut of just not can't waiting to get, you know, there in person and to experience all those things live. Yeah, I love your outlook on that too. You guys are really um, just well thought, well spoken. Um, do you think that, cause I know Lydia mentioned some of the, the dancer contracts, funds, everything like that, that kind of goes behind the scenes. Do you think that kind of interfered with the arts industry, maybe hitting that sweet spot in the the virtual streaming where everyone was streaming like concerts there were lots of sports live tvs at maybe i wasn't looking in the right place but i just didn't see a lot of arts material and i'm wondering if that was in or out of the industry's control um yes so i will talk about that a little bit uh when the pandemic started i mentioned that we had furloughed um, essentially everyone. And it actually came at a rather okay time for the dancers because during the summer, the dancers are automatically off contract. So that worked out really well for them. Um, when we're thinking of the virtual experiences, these internal, I won't call them obstacles, but definitely things to consider, um, really kind of got in the way because the dancers contracts, depending on the organization, um, there are terms in there that state they are not allowed to do more than X amount of performances. They are not allowed to do more than X amount of videos on social media. Um, and that aspect of social media and the virtual experiences um, really made us had to think outside of the box on that and just figure out, okay, how can we use our dancers, but within the terms of their contract. And there were definitely a lot of talks with 
their union at the beginning of the pandemic to figure out how can we do this? Because we want to keep them dancing. We want to keep them engaged with our audience base. How can we do that? That is still legal. Um, <laughs> so yes, there, there were definitely some interfering um, things to consider, but it all worked out <laughs> as it always does. Good, good, I'm glad. <laughs> Rebecca, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't think I have anything necessarily to, to expand on. Um, kind of share the, the, same, the same sentiment on that. Awesome. So, Michaela, I could I could just interject um, that some of the organizations like the Pittsburgh Public Theater, they pivoted very quickly during COVID. And what they did was they went after content that was in the public domain. So for instance, they did a lot of Shakespeare or things that were adaptations of work. <clears throat> and so they were able to pivot very quickly and go online with digital content. And so the, the artistic director uh, actually was very quick on her feet and coming up with a way to um, provide that digital content without having to pay for royalties, which that that was the biggest uh, obstacle. Mm -hmm. But then they also had to negotiate special contracts with Actors Equity to allow their union um, actors to to perform. So it was possible, but there there were some challenges that came about, and so. <clears throat> different organizations have handled it in uh, different ways. Yeah. Well, thank you for those very educational. <laughs> um, so I do we have until 12.30 or 12.15? 12.30. That? Okay, that's what I thought. I just want to make sure. I want to make sure we had time for questions and everything. So um, we're getting to the end here of what I have prepared, but I, I want to know your input on what you think the greatest challenge will be to kind of kickstarting the performing arts again when it's time for it to fully come back and how we as supporters of the arts can meet that challenge and help the industry overcome that. I think one of the, the biggest things that we even started discussing when this um, started happening was how do we get people back into the theaters in a safe manner? I think that's a huge um, component to a lot of people um, is that, you know, even as we see the vaccine get completely um, distributed and, and um, people are being more cognizant of washing hands and wearing masks, you'll still have people that'll say, I don't feel comfortable. Um, and I think that's something that the trust is constantly working on of how do we make people feel comfortable? You know, do we have hand sanitizers placed in the front? Do we have, you know, what, what aspects of that do we do so we can get people back into the theater feeling comfortable, um, being able to enjoy the show without worrying about COVID, the pandemic, or um, I think even now it'll make people more cognizant of just being regularly sick. I know that a lot of us, you know, when I was in school, when I was a student, you know, if I had um, like the sniffles or even allergies, Geez, I would kind of be like, oh, it's fine. I'll take some Benadryl, I'll still go to class. And I think post pandemic, you'll get a little tickle and you'll be like, I'm not going nowhere, I'm staying in the house. So I think that's that's something that we'll have to battle, um, you know, from a performing arts perspective of just kind of trying to um, not necessarily calm people down, but let them know that this is a safe space and that we've done all of the necessary precautions to make sure that you are safe while entertaining uh, live art. No, I agree with that. Safety is definitely something that we're in talks with right now um, and with our contract with the Benedum. Um, we're hopefully going to announce our next season um, at the beginning of summer, which we normally don't do. We normally announce it in the spring, um, but with all the safety restrictions and just, we've been waiting last minute to see how can we make this the safest theater possible for our patrons to come and see ballet because that's what's most important to us. Thankfully, everyone wants to come back to the theater. They just want to do it in a safe way where they feel comfortable. And we want people to feel comfortable. We don't want an uneasy audience always looking around for you know, 
problems or we want them to feel comfortable and safe and loved. So yeah, that's definitely going to be something, something to think about. Um, and then as far as kickstarting the performing arts as a whole, I think funding is going to be a huge thing to consider moving forward. Uh, we were very lucky during the pandemic to receive several um, very large grants from foundations, local governments, local businesses, um, and other organizations haven't been as fortunate. And that's just an, another negative aspect of this pandemic. And um, I think funding and what we can afford and what we can afford to make it safe, if that makes sense. I think that will be, it's just a lot to consider, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like we're on the downhill though. We, I feel like we've gotten through the, the hardest part, which is at least makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> so I wanna keep this brief because I do wanna have time for questions, but do you guys just have any advice for students graduating this year or in coming years pursuing jobs in the arts industry? Um, I will say, because um, I definitely think, um, you know, like I said earlier, Lydia's journey um, was kind of more of a straight shot. And I think for me, um, you know, the best advice someone ever gave to me was kind of like treat your career like a smorgasbord, like a buffet. <laughs> so like you go and sample, you know, this and this and this and this. So I think don't never say no is what I'll say. Um, I, I kick myself in the, the foot sometimes because you think about an opportunity or inter internship or a job that you can take because I feel like our generation has really gotten kind of like obsessed with reaching a certain goal or going a certain path so that we kind of limit ourselves, you know? And, you know, so you might be, you might get an opportunity that's not in your wheelhouse. And you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't know why I would do that. Um, I'm probably not going to work for blah, blah, blah in the future. Um, but I think it helps you become more of a Swiss army knife of a person and more kind of rounded if, if you, you know, take those opportunities and, and take those, those things that you never thought you would see yourself doing. Um, so, you know, don't get too, too obsessed on, you know, the bigger picture, kind of focus on the here and now and, and what just feels good to you in the moment. Um, and the other thing I will say is comparison is the thief of joy. Um, I think a lot of us, and I still do, do this to this day, we look at somebody else's path who graduated us at the same time and we compare and we're like, why am I not there? What did they do differently? It's not fair to you. It's not fair to them. Um, you know, I would, I would say pursue, pursue what you love. And if you, you feel like you have a calling for something, um, do it and don't compare yourselves to other people, compare yourselves to your peers or your students. Um, just, you know, find you, find, find your zen, find what makes you happy. I'm sorry, that was a lot of rambling. <laughs> no, I agree with the um, not comparing yourself with your peers because that can be a very easy and um, not so great thing to do. Um, and I, I am, also guilty of doing that. I, I might look at someone who graduated from a similar program and look at their role within a nonprofit and say, oh, I wanna do that. Um, but another thing that I really like to say with this program in this field is there really is no right or wrong way to get to a career. You just have to go out and try things. And when you go out and try things, you find departments or niches where you thought maybe you wouldn't like, but it turns out you do and you really like it. And that's what happened to me. I mean, I don't I don't think of my <laughs> career path as a straight shot. I feel like it's kind of been a zigzag, uh, but I've worked in development. I've worked with school. I've worked in finance admissions. Like I've kind of done a whole smorgasbord of everything. Um, and through it all, I found that I really liked development. I liked fundraising. I liked working with donors. And just by trying things, by opening different doors, I found my niche. Um, and that's just what you have to do sometimes. You just have to go out and try it. And there is no wrong opportunity. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was really good advice. <laughs> um, and I want to open it now to questions if anyone wants to unmute or throw something in the chat. 
now is the time. So I had I had something in the chat, but I'll go ahead and ask it uh, of both of you. So in class a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the Australian theater that's uh, remarkably opening up uh, to almost 85% capacity. Uh, Australia is just much more further ahead than the United States and other countries in terms of COVID. So, um, so one of my questions for both of you is just what, what are you learning from others that are further ahead maybe than the United States or even just fellow uh, performing arts organizations that you're about to apply to opening up, you know, with your organizations in Pittsburgh? Thank you. Um, I can answer this actually. Um, so besides being jealous of the other theaters that are opening up, I think the only other thing that we've really done is see their steps to how they re actually return to the theater and what safety measures they took and also look at the digital content that they're also producing alongside that. Um, because as different arts organizations are reopening and, and as different theaters are also opening their venues, um, we've just been kind of putting out feelers into the world and just gauging everyone's personal safety, personal comfort about everything and how these different organizations have managed to pull them back into the, into the theater. Um, and that has been kind of inspirational and very helpful, to be honest, to see others do it first and then know that we are very soon about to follow. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's just made us um, want to be more proactive. I think something that kind of, I mean, like shot us in the foot early on when this first started is that um, people had already kind of prepared that messaging and prepared um, a kind of rapid response to what they were seeing in the pandemic. And I think we were at the trust, we're waiting to get you know, that announcement from the, the tours that we were working with about them dropping out and about um, if they were still coming to Pittsburgh, um, that we weren't as proactive that, as we should have been. And I think that's something that we are, you know, seeing from other organizations, um, you know, and like you said about, about the safety and about preparing for people coming back. Um, I think we're just trying to follow suit um, and, and just be, you know, more on top of things and not let it kind of catch us off guard like it did when um, the, pan the pandemic first started. I think that's a really good segue into a question in the chat, which was considering how abrupt and surprising the pandemic and how it affected businesses, what kind of preparations do you think the arts will take for other unknown events? Um, I think prior to the pandemic, we were seeing an increase of um, just like, you know, shootings happening, very unfortunate events like that. Um, I know the incident at, at Tree of Life kind of shook all of Pittsburgh. And I think that's something else that we'll probably see the arts prepare for more. Um, I know that we put, um, we put uh, detectors at all of the theaters downtown and it caused a lot of controversy. We had a lot of people who weren't comfortable going through the detectors to get into the theater. Um, and a lot of people who, you know, didn't see the need in it. But for us, it kind of just goes back to, you know, what I said earlier is that gr the greater good is just, you know, always most important. And we would hate to put someone in a position where they are enjoying an art or enjoying a show and their life is at stake. Um, so I think we'll see more theaters across the country put in metal detectors and more venues kind of doing um, emergency drills in general, whether that be for fires, whether that be uh, having precautions for the pandemic or, you know, just across the board. I think we'll see more of those type of things take place in the arts industry. Yes, and then in terms of preparation, I think also being able to turn on a dime and just immediately adapt to whatever situation comes up is so important. And you students who are sitting here, I mean, you are about to enter an industry that is on the cusp 
and literally the cusp of something new and exciting. And I think we felt it coming for a while, um, probably since YouTube had its big boom when I was five or so. I don't even know when that was. Um, but, you know, more virtual, more platforms coming up, all of this. And, you know, being able to adapt to that, to recognize those new opportunities, whether it's safety or whether it's marketing or any department, any channel, anything, being able to adapt to it and recognize it and really just go for it and move it into the future. I think that's going to be so important to prepare. Those are some really great points and things that I think many people weren't thinking of when they said like unexpected events. I more so thought, you know, events like the pandemic, but the the violence that has happened is a really good um, thing to bring up as well. Um, another question in here is, when it comes to social media marketing, what are the biggest skills or factors needed in that field? Um, I will say, I think the important part of social media marketing um, that I learned at the Trust is the interaction that you have with your consumer and your customer. Um, I think it's so important to have, you know, a manual or language or, you know, some type of thing that the entire organization, your entire team or entire department um, heeds to, because something that I noticed is that you're going, you're going to get angry people. You're going to get angry customers. You're going to get people um, that aren't pleased with a certain aspect. Um, and social media gives them that tool to at you or DM you and let you know <laughs> how they feel. And um, I think it's, it's important to not burn bridges with the customer, um, to take all of the aspects that you may have learned in that customer service job where you worked at Wendy's at one summer and transfer it into social media marketing. It's pretty much the same aspect, but instead of a drive through window, um, it's computer to computer. Um, and I think it's also just being innovative and being creative. It, it gives you an opportunity to do campaigns and to, to do initiatives that you didn't think you would necessarily want to. Um, and use influencers, you know, use, um, you know, we're, we're starting to stray away from the traditional journalists and reporters and build communications and communities with the lifestyle bloggers that you know with the fashion bloggers, with the food bloggers, um, and really use those relationships in every aspect of, of the marketing. Yes, definitely creativity is a much needed skill when you're working in social media and also being very aware of the world around you. I mean, you need to know the product that you're selling. You need to know the organization inside and out uh, because the last thing you wanna do is to be working social media and you're posting posts that have no meaning to the audience and they just fail to connect. So really knowing yourself and what you're able to provide and also, you know, being up to date with current trends. I think that's so important. And also like Rebecca said, use the people around you, use your community to really support what you're selling, essentially. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was my question. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Um... Let's see, something else got thrown in the chat. Samuel says, I think I remember hearing that you have a public relations background. Any advice for someone thinking about possibly going into that field as well? That was for Rebecca. You're on mute. I'm really surprised I hadn't done that yet. <laughs> um, I have kind of strayed away from public relations because I got kind of enthralled into digital marketing because that is such, um, that's just such um, something that's so common right now and what most organizations are leaning towards. Um, I will say that there's no wrong or right way to go into public relations. I know that, you know, when you are studying 
um, and it might be different from when I was studying, that you are really, you know, kind of enthralled in agency life, that you want to work for a public relations agency. And I would say take more opportunities to look at things in-house, um, you know, look at nonprofit organizations, um, look at corporations, um, don't necessarily limit yourself to uh, a public relations agency or firm. Um, and yeah, just, just be open-minded because we are seeing public relations shift more into digital marketing. So, you know, in this, in this vein, there's not going to be a lot of places that you work at where you're not going to need those aspects. So you're going to be dealing with social media. Um, you're going to be dealing with, with digital marketing in addition to regular public relations. In addition to sending a press release to a media list on, you know, Meltwater or Cision, you'll have to reach out to social media influencers. So we're starting to see a more of a, a combination of, um, of the two aspects. And I think studying uh, arts management is kind of the perfect meld of, of those two things of, of kind of incorporating public relations and, and social media um, into one. Awesome, so I think this is gonna be our last question. Um, how does the artistic vision of the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater or the Cultural Trust affect the business side? Oh, so much, um, I'll, <laughs> I'll take this one. So um, a huge part of our job on the administration side working for a ballet company is to work with art the artistic vision whatever that might be. So we have a new artistic director. So she has a very different vision than what we've been used to for the past 30 years, um, which is how long our old artistic director was there for. So if you can imagine it, um, the artistic side of the company is kind of like, um, kind of a flow of endless ideas. And we are the ones in administration to kind of rein in those ideas and maybe pick pieces or parts of it and put together something that we can actually sell to the public. Um, and in that sense, it really does affect um, how we market, how we sell these products, how we talk to people, it affects everything. Um, because if you don't have artistic vision, then what are you really selling for the arts organization? Um, to give you an example, our executive director had an idea for having a ballet performance on a barge, and he called it barge ballet. And it's those like, it's just a flow of ideas, you know, it's out there in the universe and we are the ones in marketing to kind of say, I don't think so, but you know, hey, for creativity. So <laughs> it makes the job fun. It really does. Great, well, thank you so much. This is, did you have something to add, Rebecca? I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if I can do it quickly enough. <laughs> I will say it's, it's kind of a different process for us since most of the things we do is with, um, we have inside programming, but when it comes to big events like uh, the Three Rivers Arts Festival, um, we have our artistic vision, but we're also uh, bringing in outside productions. Um, so that one year we had origami where a dancer was um, dancing on top of this giant kind of like ship crate. Um, and it was such a cool experience. And it was also something that we didn't, we didn't have nothing to do with creation of it or the idea of it, but being able to collaborate and bring that kind of things to Pittsburgh um, and not feel limited by it or say that there's no way that we can do anything like that, um, I will say kind of uh, is not a great example of where our artistic vision shines through. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, this has been really fun, really informative. So thank you guys both for coming. Do you mind um, sharing if people can add you on LinkedIn or where to reach you or anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am on LinkedIn. It's just Rebecca Hansborough. Um, I'm gonna do a little uh, quick plug here. I also have a food blog, it's called The 412. So feel free to follow me <laughs> if you wanna look at food pictures. Um, and I can also be found on Facebook, uh, Rebecca Hansborough.
Yes, sorry, I just dropped my LinkedIn in the profile, but also if you want to reach me at the ballet, you can just look on our staff website and my email is right there. So if you have any questions, you can just reach out to me anytime. Always happy to help. Great, and thanks to both of you and thanks to Michaela for, for uh, hosting today. And if you want to kind of hang out, you can, but uh, this is the end of our session for now. And our next one will start at, let's see, what is it? Well, one o'clock. One o'clock. And Paige is on now. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I've kind of shortchanged the class, but what the heck. Hope you guys don't mind. And Lydia, I apologize. You know, uh, I guess I didn't get, I didn't, I wasn't.